Most of the 25 collections James Thurber published during his lifetime are dedicated to loved ones. There is an exception, though. Thurber's 1956 offering Further Fables for Our Time was dedicated to the great, now sadly nearly forgotten, news broadcaster Elmer Davis, whose comprehension of people and persons has lighted our time so that we can see where we are going. These fables are dedicated with admiration, affection, and thankfulness. I'd like to read three of the fables from a 1956 original copy of the book. Each displays enough comprehension of people and persons to light our time. The first is called Two Dogs by James Thurber. One sultry, moonless night, a leopard escaped from a circus and slunk away into the shadows of a city. The chief of police dogs assigned to the case a German shepherd named Plunger and a plainclothes bloodhound named Plod. Plod was a slow, methodical sleuth, but his uniform partner was restless and impatient. Plod set the place until Plunger snapped, We couldn't catch a turtle this way, and bounded along the trail like a whippet. He got lost. When Plod found him, half an hour later, the bloodhound said, It's better to get somewhere slowly than nowhere fast. Repose is for the buried, said the police dog. I even chase cats in my dreams. I don't, said the bloodhound. Out of scent, out of mind. As they went along, each in his own way, through the moonlessness, they exchanged further observations on life. He who hunts and turns away may live to hunt another day, commented Plod. Runs away, you mean, sneered Plunger. I never run, said the bloodhound. It's no good trailing a cat when you're out of breath, especially if the cat isn't. I figured that out myself. They call it instinct. I was taught to do what I do and not to do what I don't, the police dog said. They call it discipline. When I catch cats, cats stay caught. He added, I don't catch them. I merely find out where they are, the bloodhound said quietly. The two dogs suddenly made out a great dark house looming in front of them at the end of a lane. The trail ends right here, 20 feet from that window, the bloodhound said, sniffing a certain spot. The leopard must have leaped into the house from here. The two dogs stared into the open window of the dark and silent house. I was taught to jump through the open windows of dark houses, said Plunger. I taught myself not to, said Plod. I wouldn't grab that cat if I were you. I never grab a leopard unless it's a coat. But Plunger wasn't listening. Here goes, he said jauntily, and he jumped through the window of the dark and silent house. Instantly, there was a racket that sounded to the keen ears of the bloodhound like a police dog being forcibly dressed in women's clothes by a leopard. And that is precisely what it was. All of a moment, Plunger, dressed in women's clothes from hat to shoes, with a pink parasol thrust under his collar, came hurtling out the window. I had my knee on his chest, too, said the bewildered police dog plaintively. The old sleuth sighed. He lasteth longeth and liveth best, who gets not his knee on his quarry's chest, murmured Plod in cloudy English but fluent bloodhound. R a moral, who would avoid life's riotous laughter should not attain the thing he's after. Two dogs. Ivory Apes and People by James Thurber. A band of ambitious apes in Africa once called upon a herd of elephants with a business proposition. We can sell your tusks to people for a fortune in peanuts and oranges, said the leader of the apes. Tusks are tusks to you and us, but to people they are merchandise. Billiard balls and piano keys and the other things that people buy and sell. The elephants said they would think it over. Be here tomorrow at this time and we will swing the deal, said the leader of the apes. And the apes went away to call on some people who were hunting for merchandise in the region. It's the very best ivory, the leader of the apes told the leader of the people. 100 elephants, 200 tusks, all yours for oranges and peanuts. That's enough ivory for a small ivory tower, said the leader of the power of the people. Or 400 billiard balls and 1,000 piano keys. And I will cable my agent to ship your nuts and oranges and to sell the billiard balls and piano keys. The business of business is business and the heart of the matter is speed. We will close the deal, said the leader of the apes. Where is the merchandise now, inquired the leader of the people. It's mating, uh, eating, but it will be at the appointed place at the appointed hour, replied, replied the chief ape. But it wasn't. The elephants had thought it over and reconsidered, and they forgot to show up the following day, for elephants are good at forgetting when forgetting is good. There was a great to-do in the marts of the world trade when the deal fell through and everybody except the elephants got into the litigation that followed. The Better Business Bureau, the Monkey Business Bureau, the Interspecies Commerce Commission, the Federal Courts, the National Association of Merchandisers, the African Bureau of Investigation, the International Association for the Advancement of Animals, and the American Legion. 
Opinions were handed down, rules were promulgated, subpoenas were issued, injunctions were granted and denied, and objections were sustained and overruled. The Patriotic League of American Women Against Subversion took an active part until it was denounced as subversive by a man who later withdrew his accusation and made a fortune on the sale of two books. I made my bed and I lie in my teeth. The elephants kept their ivory and nobody got any billiard balls or piano keys or a single nut or an orange. Moral? Men of all degrees should form this prudent habit. Never serve a rabbit stew before you catch the rabbit. Ivory apes and people. And Oliver and the other ostriches. An austere ostrich of awesome authority was lecturing younger ostriches one day on the superiority of their species to all other species. We were known to the Romans, or rather the Romans were known to us, he said. They called us Avastruthio, and we called them Romans. The Greeks called us Struthion, which means truthful one, or if it doesn't, it should. We are the biggest birds and therefore the best. All his listeners cried, hear, hear, except a thoughtful one named Oliver. We can't fly backward like the hummingbird, he said aloud. The hummingbird is losing ground, said the old ostrich. We're going places. We're moving forward. Hear, hear, cried all the ostriches except Oliver. We lay the biggest eggs and therefore the best eggs, continued the old lecturer. The robin's eggs are prettier, said Oliver. Robin's eggs produce nothing but robins, said the old ostrich. Robins are lawn-bound worm addicts. Hear, hear, cried all the other ostriches except Oliver. We get along on four toes, whereas man needs ten, the elderly instructor reminded his class. But man can fly sitting down. We can't fly at all, commented Oliver. The old ostrich glared at him severely, first with one eye, then the other. Man is flying too fast for a world that is round, he said. Soon he will catch up with himself in a great rear-end collision, and man will never know that what hit man from behind was man. Hear, hear, cried all the other ostriches except Oliver. We can make ourselves invisible in time of peril by sticking our heads in the sand, ranted the lecturer. Nobody else can do that. How do we know we can't be seen if we can't see, demanded Oliver. Sophistry, cried the old ostrich. And all the other ostriches except Oliver cried sophistry without knowing what it meant. Just then the master in the class heard a strange, alarming sound. It sounded like thunder growing close and growing closer. It was not the thunder of weather, though, but the thunder of a vast herd of rogue elephants in full stampede, frightened by nothing, fleeing nowhere. The old ostrich and all the other ostriches except Oliver quickly stuck their heads in the sand. Oliver took refuge behind a large nearby rock until the storm of beasts had passed, and when he came out he beheld a sea of sand and bones and feathers, all that was left of the old teacher and his disciples. Just to be sure, however, Oliver called the roll, there was no answer till he came to his own name. Oliver, he said. Hear, hear, said Oliver. And that was the only sound there was on the desert except for a faint final rumble of thunder on the horizon. Moral, thou shalt not build thy house, nor thy fate, upon the sand. That's Countdown. I'm Keith Olbermann. Good night and good luck.